what this is is a grind height chart and on the other side I've got some instructions on how to to forge a dagger my way now there's there's a couple of options that we're going to discuss as we progress along but uh, we'll pass these around and I'm going to just keep one back for myself to reference to the camera and then once I'm done with it afterwards somebody else can have that piece yeah daggers are intimidating and the success of a dagger revolves around symmetry and you must trust your eyes because the slightest asymmetry non-symmetrical blade you have and the slightest out of center that you grind this blade your eye will pick it up very often you don't even have to measure it you just have to look and something is out and if something is out trust your instinct and figure out what it is and it's gonna be symmetry of course it's a dagger the first thing I'd like to share share with you is perhaps some layout in the shop um, a couple of little things about your own workshop and the setup for grinding in general um, vision is the first big requirement you need excellent light so uh, in this instant over here we if my demo uh, if my demo sucks we'll blame the light <laughs> you need an excuse however um, yeah good lighting if you need reading glasses you will wear them and another little trick that I have found over time is that wearing a baseball cap while grinding makes your vision better now usually a workshop will have overhead fluorescent tubes and if you've got overhead lights coming into your workshop your the pupils in your eyes close up and whatever you look at is darker that if you can shield your eyes from overhead light whatever you look at is brighter and usually brighter is just better vision when you switch on your light can you see the shadow on my face I'm going to turn to the camera you see how you, the, your reading lamp throws light on the corner of your eyes and comes usually in the back of your reading glasses make sure that the light is just angled like that that you don't get the sharp light coming in the side of your eye you don't want outside light the, the light must be shining on the job and nothing into your face so that's just a little small small side note um, also if you have your belt grinder positioned at a uh, doorway you know garage door or windows in front of you rather turn the machine slightly obliquely away from that you're not looking out into the bright sunshine outside for the same reason your your pupils will contract but you want to take advantage of the the natural light coming in from a window or a door so just take these kind of things uh, into consideration as well all right so I've got just a blade blank here and what I want to do here is lay out my center lines and show you perhaps how from a rough forged blade you might get symmetrical curves now often people will make uh, a template for a dagger and they will try and make the template perfectly symmetrical and clamp the, the template and scribe both sides at the same time so the, the trick that I have well it's not a trick is to take templates and I've taken these ones that I have here specifically you see that chef knife and a kind of asymmetrical sticking knife of some sort and you are going to utilize is the camera getting all of this very nicely on the screen I'm, I'm hoping so if if I must uh, change my angle you must let me know but you will use one side of your template like that and flip it over to the other side like that you with me so using the exact same profile for both sides right so once you have your two outlines laid out now you're needing to get the center line perfect the way I do that first specs I haven't been re re wearing specs for all that long and sometimes I quite haven't decided whether I want them or not all right so I would take my dividers and set them at a size that looks approximately like the center like that and make a slight adjustment for 
So if you're not quite right, you adjust by half the error. You're going to make a line there and there. And then somewhere down the blade, you're going to do the same thing. You eyeball it. Right. Now you're going to take your ruler and some small G clamps. Let's do it this way. Can you see the scribe line I'm lining up on? It's tiny details. So bear in mind this is a demo and sometimes one tries to rush it just a little bit and back home one would be really paying attention to the tiniest of details. Well, that's my excuse anyway. All right, so now with your scriber, which I'm hoping I did put in the... Okay, I'll use the dividers, never mind. You're going to scribe a line down your blade. And strangely enough, I'm not overly concerned about the line right, right at the tip as far as the bevels are concerned. What I'm really wanting to be sure is that the center line runs right through the middle of the tang and comes out at the tip. The point of the knife and the tip of the tang, everything must be in one straight line. Like that. And once you take the straight edge off, the idea is, is that the line runs right down the center of that blade. Okay, now I do notice either I'm off center by my marking out or my tang, whether by forging or grinding, uh, is not perfect up here. So bear in mind, this is a blank that I've just kind of roughly prepared in advance. I didn't do any of this layout at home. So this tang is not perfectly in line. Do you see that? There we go. Can you see that? Okay. Now, if you had a rough forged profile, if you weren't going to use a template, one can set your dividers up at the radius of that knife like that, when I say the radius, the, the, you set the radius of your dividers to half the width of your blade and you draw circles on a center line. Right down the blade, you keep drawing in circles all the way down the blade. And when you go to your grinder, you're going to profile until the profile just touches the scribed circle all the way down the blade. And that way you're going to get a pretty damn accurate symmetry. Okay, can you see the circles? There, this one here at the tip, that one you can see clearly. So you would grind that edge until it touches the circle evenly all the way down the length of the blade. So there's a couple of ways to get symmetry. So either way you're going to use your uh, template or you just have a center line with a bunch of circles with it, and uh, you can use, um, that's my, let's call them the cheap circle stencils. It's just the little tub with little washers, mostly coins, and you're going to use these also as circle stencils. I find them easier to, to scribe around the outside of a, of a disc than it is to scribe on the inside of a circle stencil. 
And I'm going to use these when I start laying out my, my plungers. All right, so I'm going to now decide on the length of my ricasso. Now, this is something that we have discussed uh, on our long courses at Heaven Forge, but there is a certain pleasing rectangular form that just is easy on the eye. And if you look at window frames, the, the profile of an A4 book, uh, there's so many different rectangles you can look at that have a mathematical ratio width to height. And they will call that the golden, re golden rectangle. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, Fibonacci sequence is another, another name one can write down and go and Google. It's a really interesting um, mathematical phenomenon, uh, phenomenon that lends itself to artistic layout and design. So what we find is that there's a math mathematical sequence that goes as follows. One, one, you add one and one and you get two. You add one and two and you get three. So, so far, just by those few numbers, you can have a ratio of one to one. So, with a colon between the numbers, one to one. So, a square has a, a pleasing shape. A rectangle that is in ratio one to two will also work. All right. But then you're adding two and three and the next number is five. So, two thirds works. So if you've got a clip on a Bowie knife, if you can use one-third to two-thirds as a ratio. You can use two-thirds as a ratio. And that's a number that I like to use on ricassos. So if you just visualize the width of a ricasso, how long must it be? It must be two-thirds as it is wide or two-fifths. And it somehow works. Okay, you can go into the mathematical calculation. Uh, I don't, I won't do that right now. And as you go down the sequence, as those numbers get bigger and bigger, and you start dividing them in, into each other, like 3 divided by 2, and 5 divided by 3, eventually you land up with a constant, which is only slightly variable in the, uh, in the decimals, way down in the sequence, and you, you get a number 1.618. Uh, you may, there was even, I think, was it a whiskey advert? On TV, when things are perfect, what was it? Yeah, 1.618 is the number. So that's the ratio, 1 to 1.6, give or take. Right, so I'm going to scribe a line across the width of this, this blade. And I'm going to make sure that all my plungers line up exactly on that origin. Now, how far is the distance to the other side? And I'm going to measure or transfer with my dividers from there to the other side. And again, I'm going to lay it out. And you will spend some time making sure that this is perfect because it's the symmetry that matters here. All right, so this dimension there, 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 and there. You've got four bevels, not two. Now, another cool little tool that I have, and I bought this one overseas, but it's an easy, easy thing to build, is an edge scriber. Now, stock removers are typically grinding their blades from parallel stock. So they will have something like this, where you, or a height gauge, where this little scribe point is set at various heights you got that I'm going to turn it to show you the heights there we go the height is adjustable but this only works if your steel is parallel bladesmiths forge a distal taper into their blades we need a little gadget to scribe a center line down a tapered piece of steel okay so that's where this little thing comes in handy and all this is, is two pins and a scriber. The center scriber obviously is hard, so that was a hardened dowel pin. And you make this on your milling machine, and you use your dial on the milling machine to get the distances between 
all three positions perfect. Because if, if they're not laid out exact, this tool is not going to work properly. So the accuracy in making this little thing uh, is important. And the way this works is simply to, to take this tool, put it over your steel, and turn it sideways. And you start at the ricasso, and you, you just do this. It's a really cool little tool. I'll do it the other side and then show you. Can you get that on camera? Is it coming out all right? Look at that. Perfectly all the way down the blade. doesn't matter if it tapers thick to thin. It works all the way. The only place it doesn't really work is right near the tip where one of the little legs falls off the point. Like that. Okay, so it stops slightly short. But anyway, you're going to eyeball that, and very often I'm going to even land up resorting to handwork. Don't be afraid of handwork. Handwork will do things slowly and more accuracy, more accurate with a lot more control than a machine running at hundreds of feet per second. And, uh, well, I don't know, what is a typical belt speed? 60 something feet per second. All right, now I'm going to just make a little plunge on every start position and run a bevel down my cutting edges just to break the corner. Um, some guys who like to just uh, do these little pre-grinds will then heat treat the knife and grind everything else afterwards. That's also fine. Um, I'm going to just get used to this machine to start with as well. So uh, I do like to run the belt fast. I find that I am a lot more steady. A belt that runs slowly tends to hook and suck me. Um, and you'll find the joint that comes around is more uh, knocking. It's goof, 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 goof as it comes around. But if you run it fast, it's just like a smooth, bzz, just grind. It doesn't jerk. All right, let's see how this goes. All right, sorry, we'll just sort that out because your tr the tracking on your belt must be nice and steady. You want to fine tune the, the tracking. And I find that by hanging the belt slightly over on the Ricasso side allows the belt to flex on that side and you get a nice, smooth, rounded plunge. And this is what the kind of grind that I'm going to try and do. All right, while, while they're sorting the grinder out, um, the other thing that I'm going to do here is I want a converging Ricasso. I don't want the grind lines to meet perfectly in the middle right at the Ricasso. I want a little... Uh, flat, and, flat triangular ricasso extending, a little flat extending down the middle of the blade between the bevels. So it's not going to be full height. And this, this forces me to grind to the line perfectly and no further. So I'm going to decide on a grind height that is not right up to the middle and make a little mark there and there. Can you see that? Let me do it darker. There we go. Okay, so this is how high I'm going to grind there. Both sides. And this is where I'm going to be using my... Um, are you going to just form the, form the wheel? Okay, so run at high speed. Flat. Yeah, it's got a little bump. Yeah, point that out. I mean, that might be somebody's problem at home too, where your, your, your drive wheel's rubber kind of wears off unevenly. Can you get that? You know, there's a little ridge right there. And if we run the machine at high speed, Niels is going to carefully just smooth that over. All right, so let's see what coin will give us a nice transition there. So let's take the two rand, and I'm going to lay the two rand coin exactly into the, in the corner of the layout lines. So layout and planning is really important. Now a lot of people, who, bladesmiths that is, will try to forge the bevels. That's also all right. Especially if you've got a double-edged dagger that has uh, double toils, uh, 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 
where the cutting edge is wider than the ricasso, you, you will forge the bevel somewhat. But on this knife, I would simply forge my dagger to profile and to taper, distal taper. I wouldn't attempt to forge the bevels themselves. That just complicates the, the, whole, the whole layout and grind because if you've got one hammer strike out of position, it forces you to, to grind the knife in a certain way. All right, can you see that? There we go. All right, so there, you can see I've got a couple of double layout lines, which I wouldn't normally want. All right, so as with any grinding, your grinding stance is important. I like to stand in front of the machine with my forearms and wrists against my stomach. Typically, I would want the, the center height of the belt to be, or the wheel to be about navel high. Okay, so I'm going to apply pressure to the belt and sway my body. I move my body left to right. From, from behind, it's this kind of motion. Kind of looks sexy. <laughs> okay, you sway like that. You're not moving your arms left to right, you're moving your body. All right, so here we are. We're going to plunge. I'm going to stay away from my layout lines. And as you touch down on a brand new belt, it's going to throw off a whole lot of grit, so make sure your glasses are on. Okay, so I've got quite a distance to go. And I'm not, I don't grind up to the center line. All right, now something that, that is described in those notes that we've handed out. I can grind the bevels at even angle from the, from the ricasso, holding the knife evenly against the belt all the way out to the tip. Now what that's going to give you is a very sleek, slim blade. Now, depending on the application, let's say for example, uh, you're making a medieval dagger that's application is to be used against chainmail armor. That dagger point needs to be robust, strong. It comes to a needle point, but it's like almost a square cross section. Very stiff blade, but to a needle sharp point. If that blade were ground too thin, it's going to be flexible. And if your victim wriggles, he's going to break your blade. Okay, and they tend to wriggle. <laughs> okay, so, so what I'm going to do on this particular blade, because it demonstrates something different, is to grind a blade with the cutting edge angles at more obtuse angles. They are steeper angles towards the tip, and they get flatter towards the ricasso. So I'm constantly, and if the grinder can look at my hand, I will be constantly doing this as I move up and down the blade. Do you see that? I call that the, the motorbike throttle. Okay, so you, you, you're moving your wrist like this. But I will do the tip at its own individual angle. You see how I'm holding this knife? I'm making a short knife out of a long knife. All right, so I'm holding it with just, I don't know, 80 millimeters sticking out my hand. Now I'm going to grind the tip. So I'm just getting my hand out of the way of this star wheel. Now while I'm there, I'm going to do the equal opposite side. So I flip the knife around like this without changing anything in my body position. Does that make sense? Because if I have to reteach my body to grind the other hand, All right, have a look at there. 
All right, so I'm going to now swap sides. Okay, get my hands against my my body. Now, do you see how you keep constant pressure of the blade nicely in the middle of the belt? You can watch your sparks and see that you either are too much one side or the other, and it's that which causes blades to have ripples in them. I'm constantly thinking in, my, in the back of my mind that I only want to grind in the middle of the belt. I don't want to grind on the corners. I mean, you, you are at the end of the day, but I'm trying to not imagine that in my mind. All right, so focus there. All right, so they are, they don't meet in the middle. Obviously, only right down there they do. All right, my cutting edge thickness is over a millimeter. You're not making your edge too thin. Rather do more grinding at a lower speed after heat treat. Alright, so I'm just going to raise that grind just a little bit. And I can kind of see the line in this light. <laughs> You see I swapped the blade around from this side to this side. My body hasn't changed. It remembers what I did a moment ago. It's called muscle memory. Right, trying to get the height similar. Swap sides. Okay, so I've just broadened the bevels. So now I'm going to move back up to the ricasso, but not entirely. And I'm going to sneak up onto the bevels, onto the, the ricasso dimension as we go. Something I often see on daggers is that the cutting edges don't come together soon after the plunge. The blade thickness is very thick and the cutting edge is not sharp for a whole length down the blade. I'm not a particular fan of that. If you do it with intention, that's different. But uh, in my opinion, the dagger should be sharp for the most of its length. Um, that particular pet hate uh, I see sometimes even on folding knives where you've got a little little folding knife with an 8 centimeter blade and maybe it's not sharp where the grinds don't come together for maybe 15 millimeters or 10 millimeters of that little blade. So that's like approaching 20% of your knife that has no edge. Uh, I think that's unacceptable. Especially on a knife that's meant for cutting. You know, a knife like this, you could say, okay, well, it's not meant for slicing bultong. Uh, it's, a, it's a poking tool. All right, so can you see how once I start establishing a hollow, the wheel will constantly fall into, sorry, the lights in your way. The wheel will constantly fall into that position. And as you start getting the, the groove deeper and deeper, it actually becomes easier and easier. Grinding daggers with small diameter wheels gives you a very deep grind with a very crisp, prominent center ridge. 
It just reflects light and makes it look... Oh, Niels, thanks, man. <laughs> uh, and it's adjustable. <laughs> You see that? My body is swaying. I'm not moving my hands. Now the angle of the bevel on the long length of the blade is very shallow, meeting that bevel angle near the tip, which is steeper. And somewhere in between, I'm going to have to blend. Ooh, there we go. That's... I don't want to take the mickey out of anybody, but that looks like some people's grinds. <laughs> okay, zoom into that. That's, I did that on purpose. So, th so that I did on purpose to show you what you don't want to do. Okay, see how though you got multiple facets there? There we go, you can see it. You want one smooth curve in that grind. I know the camera battles on these shiny surfaces with all the light on it. That is, I do think, better. Can it come from my left side? Thank you. Just, just behind? There we go. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, to be honest, Niels, can we just put back that side? <laughs> I'm joking with you. No? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, now if you can put it on the ground, it's good. <laughs> yep. All right, so there I'm blending out. As you apply pressure to the belt, come down... Imagine you're an airplane touching, on, touching down on a runway. You're not just bouncing down like a helicopter. You approach the belt as, as an airplane on a runway would. Gently at, at motion. All right, so, and that is what's going to give you this radius plunge here. All right, where I'm pointing. That must be a radius. And we're going to try and get all four plunges equal. All right, easier said than done, but that's our mission. We're not quite there yet. All right, so now I'm getting close to the lines. You do a little bit at a time, blending one into the other. And don't always start at the same place. Start at different places. Start in the middle, moving to the left. Start in the middle, move to the right. Start at the right, moving to the left. And that way you're going to never get... Can you remember this on our broad flat grinding uh, platens? The two-inch two dip, it's called. You know, the mistake that they've given a name. It's so common. Now, in this case, your, your belt is 25 millimeters wide. If you constantly start your grind at the same place you're going to slowly, slowly over time create a dip, possibly, with the opposite corner of the belt. You're so busy concentrating at the plunge, you forget the fact that it's grinding on the other side of the wheel as well. So if you start just a little bit down the blade and move to the left, start right down the blade, move to the right, that's, that's going to just mix things up just a little bit that you never land up with a dip. Now you'll notice I've not yet given my, my plunges too much attention. And also don't grip your knife too hard. If you grip your knife too hard, you will force, a, force the knife to grind a facet. The knife has to be held light enough that as you apply pressure to the wheel, the wheel can snuggle into that hollow. It nestles in there. It finds the position that the knife wants to be in. If you hold it too firm, you're going to force it in a different direction. Does that make sense? 
All right, so I've got the same bevel or the same hand on each side pretty much roughed in. I'm going to now swap hands and run the belt off the other corner of the wheel. Often people are pedantic about putting their blades in water before heat treat. It is a concern. You don't want to burn it blue. It does create unequal stresses that may come out in the heat treat. But burning your steel or overheating your steel before heat treat changes nothing in the steel itself other than a few stresses. And if you're leaving your blade oversized anyway, which you should be doing, I've never really had big drama because of it. All right, we're starting to get kind of neat looking bevels there. Can you see what's going on there? All right, so this tapered triangle running right down the middle of the blade, that's what I'm looking for. The bevel's perfectly symmetrical on both sides, and that flat, that tapering triangle in the middle, must be perfectly symmetrical on both sides. Now right over there where my thumbnail is, don't look at my dirty fingers, right there where my thumbnail is, can you see where the two bevel angles meet? There's kind of you know, steep bevels and flatter bevels, and all in this region here I'm going to have to blend them in. I'll do that just now. This is a technique that was taught at a, a hammer in day back in the early 80s. I bunked school to attend a hammer in at Owen Wood's place. Does anyone know who he was or is? Owen Wood from Honeydew. Yeah, he's one of our proud exports. He's now living in Colorado doing great stuff. All right, so. Yeah, I, I bunked school to attend a, a guild-sanctioned hammering. Had a whole bunch of different guild members demonstrating, and uh, Owen demonstrated this method of dagger grinding, and he called it stage grinding. If I do recall, you grind your blade in different stages. You grind the main part of the straight part of your knife. You grind the tip. You grind the plunges, and you blend everything into each other. You, it's very difficult, if not impossible to grind from the plunge, sweeping all the way across the blade, twisting your wrist with that motorbike maneuver right into the tip in one continuous swipe. I'll admire the guy who does that consistently on long daggers. I don't think it's possible. The grinding water, Niels, should not have oil in it. Okay, this, this I know is from quenching tongs and it's forging tongs, but you're going to have your grinding water at the grinders and that doesn't have oil in it. I'm feeling now my hands are slippery. Near man, sorry man. No, I'm not complaining. <laughs> okay, and let me just check on something else. Well done. Well done. Well done. Your quench, your, your grinding water should have a little bit of dish soap in it. Now the purpose of the dish soap is to wash the oil off your hands from the other bucket. Uh, I have a water, thanks. Yes, is now he's sucking up. Okay. Yeah, so the dish soap is there to, I mean, in my workshop, I've got the drill press over here, and I'm using machine, machine uh, soluble oil at the drill press, and I've got a knife that's got also oil. I will wash my knife in the soapy water, rinse my hands, and I don't have to go around the side to where the wash basin is to wash my hands. So that's one thing. But the soapy water breaks the surface tension on the water that every time you quench your knife, the grit and the sediment sinks to the bottom. You never land up with grit floating on the top of your bucket. And you'll also find, obviously, from you'll just keep topping that water up. You never throw it out somehow. I don't. 
I just keep topping it up. And then maybe when it's time for a hammer and you like spring clean properly and you throw the water out and you find this thick layer of sludge at the bottom. You know, it's grinding, grinding dirt at the bottom of your bucket. You know, there's Loch Ness monsters living inside there. Um, but uh, it prevents your, your bucket going stinky. You know, your water doesn't go smelly. So, you know, the, but it must be lemon. That's, that's. All right, now we back to work again. And one will be positioning these thumbs. Do the, can you see, the, I'll move this thumb either closer to the edge or closer to the spine. And small manipulations in the way I position this thumb will manipulate the pressure in the direction I want to grind. A common mistake is to twist the knife and come to the belt at a fresh new angle. Don't do that. Put it into the same hollow that you've always been grinding in, even if it's not in the right place, and by just maneuvering your thumb pressure, just encourage it to go in the direction you want it to go. Don't twist it into a new position because then you've created a new facet. You want to keep one facet, one hollow, and just help it in the direction you want to go. Okay, that, that I think is quite a useful, important thing. Now it wouldn't be long now before I would almost start considering uh, heat treating this blade and doing further refining on a hard blade. But for the demo now we're going to make it look, look pretty. Alright, you see what I've just done there? I've made a short knife out of it again and I'm going to blend the two facets into each other. And I can feel it rolling in my hand as it moves from one angle to the next. One will use all your senses. It's something I keep telling my students. You don't just look at what you're doing. You're going to rely as much on feel, you know, because now you're feeling that hollow, as hearing. And as long as everything is going well, there's a certain sound your, your steel makes against the belt. And I've called that falling rain. It's a pleasant sound. It's just that that hissing, hissing, swishy sound that, that it makes, that's falling rain. That's when you're, you're grinding well. But when you hear fighting cats, that kind of grating, okay, that, that kind of sound is when you are pushing your knife in, a, in the wrong angle and you're creating a facet, usually combined with an intensifying, of, that the sparks get bigger and brighter. Stop. Before you grind any further, stop. Because... You're just making nonsense. All right, so let's, let's see what we're going to do here. We're going to blend the other side. Now realize you are grinding on a blade. That, yo, what happened there? Niels, your rubber climbed off the aluminium. Because right at the tip, I'm going to hand work it. And I'm going to do that with a file. After hardening, I do it with a, with a stone. Whether you do it just with a regular carborundum oil stone, or you get uh, the EDM stones that they sell through uh, Toolquip Allied. They come in 220 and 600 grit, and they 100 long by 20 square. That's the size you want. And you're going to stone the steel right near the tip. And that's how you get your lines so crisp and meeting right at the tip. I'm going to do that with the files in a second. All right, so right at the tip here, can you see, see at the tip, it's not perfect. And to get that, right, you see that it's slightly irregular, doesn't come out exactly at the point, pointy point, but it's close enough for... Just the tiniest bit of handwork to fix. We'll do that. All right, now I'm going to start working at the 
the plunge lines. Now this is where any collector who knows what he's looking at is going to evaluate your work. And uh, you want to make sure that it's as good as it can be there. Now what I'll do is the hand that holds the handle, I'm going to just very lightly run the index finger up against the inside of the wheel and that's going to give me extra stability to just reference off the wheel that I don't land up taking a great big old bite out. All right, I will run the machine just a tiny bit slower. One is doing more detail work now, but not dead slow. Realize that if you start doing this detail work on a hardened blade, the steel grinds slower. As you get closer and closer to the line, you would then change your grit size. And that in turn would make your mistakes happen slower. So a little bit at a time and very often I say to people to, to shift the line. It's a thought in your mind that you do not transfer into your hands. It's that subtle. The moment you start making corrections with your hands, it's already too much. So just subconsciously almost will the steel in the direction you want to go. This is a psychological thing you're doing here. It, you know, your hands will sort of automatically follow what your brain tells it but if you allow the hands to do too much then you've gone too far very very gentle subtle work I'm not pressing hard and I'm allowing the, the knife to fall into the hollow perfectly every time and certainly this is practice it's not I'm getting used to this machine by the way it is, it is practice. It won't, you will not get a perfect grind on the first knife you make. But you need to have the guts to just go for it. You know, so often people say they, they never do a dagger because they're too scared. Well then... You see what I'm doing with this other hand's finger now, this, this side that's holding the handle. I hope watching this demo is not like watching paint dry. And look every time. All right, I'm staying just the tiniest bit away from the lines. And in this case, I'm looking at the symmetry with my eyes. I think more than I'm following the lines blindly, because my layout lines were less than perfect. All right, can you zoom on to that? Uh, I'm going to maybe move it if you need to, but I'm going to just put a finer belt on, uh, running it slower just to refine things. Can you see that? 
How many minutes, Stuart? All right, so, all right, so you see where I am at my layout lines. I'm just, just short of the lines. Okay, if I tip it like that. Okay, there you can see clearly. Quite similar the other side. All right, so let me just clean them up a little bit, and then I'm going to draw file the, the tip, and then we'll see where we are. I'm hanging the belt very slightly over the corner that's closest to the ricasso. Right, I would be I would be doing this on a 180 belt also before heat treatment, even though I'm still thick, because I don't want to quench a dagger blade fully hard on a rough 60 grit belt. I feel those coarse grit scratches could be stress rises. So I run over it with a 180 before heat treat and then after heat treatment I bring it back down to size again with a 60 grit. So I repeat what I've done. All right, here we go, pretty close. Okay. So, uh, essentially that is... quite neat. Okay, so those plunges are not all raggedy, they are smooth. Okay, I'll move the knife all the way down the blade. One bevel all the way through to the tip. See that it comes out at the tip almost in position. See that it's slightly off. But to try and grind that is really difficult. So what we'll do real quick, and even if I just have to simulate it, okay, so I'm taking a very smooth file, and I've got a block of wood at home that I would clamp in the vise, but right at the tip, so even if your, your dagger blade is hollow ground, I'm taking a file and turning the tip into a flat. It's a hollow ground file. <laughs> it's a flat file, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm just pushing that center line into the middle. Sorry, Frank, I wasn't trying to be funny. And then after hardening, you would take a stone literally a sharpening stone, a carborundum stone, and you would, you would file your steel with a stone and then progress on with your um, hand polishing. You would hand polish the very tip with a flat stick and the rest of the hollow with the, the formed polishing sanding block, whether it's a hard rubber or a wood. And where, where the hollow meets the flat, you just blend it and you're not going to see a transition. Can the camera get that? I see. So that, that comes nicely out to the point. What, the, the blending? They're going to judge symmetry. If it's symmetrical, uh, and you're allowed to submit a flat ground dagger, or a hollow ground dagger, a hand filed dagger, it doesn't matter. Symmetry. Workmanship is judged by the end result, not how you got there. All right. All right, everybody, I think you, I hope you got the gist of it. 
I will pack away the tools, uh, but what I will leave on the bench here is a couple of the other dagger samples. Some of them have been from previous demos. You will see the layouts, you will see the different blades that have been ground with different techniques. Uh, somewhere I've kept the angle consistent and I've got a much more slender blade profile. Others where I've I've rolled the, the blade and landed up with a very heavy cross section, almost like a square towards the tip. Um, one that I will point out just briefly in parting, the most challenging part of this grind is the plungers at the Ricasso. Have a look at some of the Fairburn Sykes um, British Commando dagger. Look at that one there. It contains, it possesses no Ricasso. The bevels go all the way through to the end. So maybe consider that as a, this a transition project where you practice a dagger grind but leave the, leave the plungers out of your design entirely. Um, this kind of tang was notoriously uh, flawed on those originals. So this I'm making according to a technical drawing from the war office or to wherever it came from. And for this tang to fit inside that uh, turned brass handle, it has to be this small. And the original was that small. So you make sure that you, when you make these knives, you draw a proper temper into the tang, just into the ricasso a little bit to help strengthen that transition zone right there at the shoulders. But this tang here is not, not the best example to follow. So. Let me highlight that point. Narrow tangs can and should be strongly constructed. These skinny little rat tailed tangs or where people are drilling into the back of blades and screwing high tensile bolts, that's, that's not a strong construction. Sometimes it's justified by people saying it's an art knife, it'll never be used. Well, I don't know, I don't always follow that, that argument. Every knife is a using tool. It should be. All right. Thank you very much.